Smoke. We will hear from Baylor men's basketball coach, national championship coach Scott Drew here in about 15 or 20 minutes. Edgar Thompson, Orlando Sentinel, covers Florida. He's been on with us before on 365 Sports and Sikkim 365 Radio. Well, Edgar, I guess that time came. Uh, you uh, you told me yesterday you were spending time, I guess, talking to players and such around the program. What was mainly the reaction you had or received yesterday on the firing? They were pretty blindsided by it. But, you know, they get that bunker mentality, man. They don't really see it from, like, the outside. They don't see it from, like, the fan perspective or the media, like, you know, looking at the how things are like declining they're just practicing and trying to improve and and they knew they weren't doing well but they also know they played in three straight new year's six balls even though the last showing was the cotton ball which was a debacle but they feel like hey the program's done pretty well under dan right having a bad year but they just they don't understand the business quite as well now i don't know that i understand the business all that well sometimes either because to me, it's like this, you know, really just like a stretch of bad games and that was enough to get rid of them. And then you talk to Scott Strickland and you start to realize there were maybe some deeper concerns foundationally, systematically, and they felt like, look, we need to get someone in here to address those other areas. Yeah, Dan's a great offensive coach, guys. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that even though the offense has kind of petered out of late. And part of that's because the, the Emory Jones quarterbacking has been subpar, and I don't think you trust the kid. But you just can't, like, that isn't the whole program, scoring points and, and you know, putting out an entertaining product. Um, it is recruiting, which Dan was pretty lackluster at. It is presenting well. It's being predictable for your boss, Right. You don't need a guy who goes out there and you're like, what's he going to say this time? I mean, he isn't Lane Kiffin on Twitter, but not in front of a damn microphone. You just don't know what Dan's going to do or say or, you know, whether he's going to be in a decent mood or upset or petulant making excuses or something. So it, it, I think it, it run its course. It's hard. It's crazy to say that after, you know, less than 50 games or whatever ran its course, but it did. Edgar, I, I don't know, and I've seen I've seen the the coaches come and go at Florida that that have you know Ron Zook uh, went out fight one you know won his last game against FSU um, you know uh, Jim McElwain and, I was there yeah so uh, Jim McElwain and Will Muschamp both uh, you know both went out fighting I don't know if I've ever seen what happened on Saturday night happen with not just Florida but any coach but I'm just comparing it to the others where Dan Mullen at the end of that game played for overtime when he had significant time to at least attempt to get in a field goal range and then that kind of bled over into the overtime where Missouri played to win and, and Dan looked like he was kind of done with it then there was something to be said that Dan seemed to just almost lose interest on some level uh, I mean just the sense of it I mean he would push back on that I'm sure if he was truly honest I think he kind of got beaten down by some things I think facilities ultimately frustrated them as they have every coach for the last four now. There was rumors at the time when Urban left, indoor practice facility, he'd won it for a few years up to that point. It's like, man, I'm not getting what I need. And plus he's melting down, you know. So it's like he took that year off, went to Ohio State where they give you everything. Um, must champ, no indoor. Uh, finally McElwain came and got an indoor. But then the standalone was he was pushing for that, and here we are. That still isn't here. It opens in the spring. So the next coach is going to get a standalone that Dan Mullen broke ground on, essentially. He's over there with a hard hat and a shovel, and now he's not even going to get to use it. So there were some frustrations with that, and I think, you know, he just he just got worn down by the fan base and going out every week and people wondering if, you know, what's wrong and and. Do you feel like your job's safe? I mean, if that started happening after the South Carolina loss, that stuff wears on a guy quickly, even the guys that make $7.5 million. But what I'll say at the end of that game, to my point about Emory Jones, I think Dan lost trust in Emory Jones. I mean, he didn't trust him. He felt like we're going to play for OT. We got a great trick play with Trent Whittemore, which worked to perfection. That was his last play call for the Gators. It was a trick play that worked perfectly. 
but then they didn't go for two. You're on the road. Go for two. Go for the jugular. They didn't. Missouri did. Won the game. So, Edgar, Greg Knox now takes over. I realize there's a lot of moving parts. So, what does the staff look like uh, heading into the game with the Knowles? I mean, it's a train wreck, man. It's a skeleton crew. <laughs> it's like there's no defensive coordinator you start the season with. They got a 31-year-old guy doing that. It seemed like – I tell you, they came to play against Missouri. I'll give the Gators credit for their effort level and energy. They played pretty well there defensively. But, again, the key breakdown. They end up with a defensive end rusher or pass rusher guarding a guy on a 41-yard touchdown, right? They commit an interference penalty. Trey Dean, who has had this four years of nothing here, and he commits a bad penalty to keep a drive going and give him that shot at the field goal, which they missed somehow, Missouri's kicker. Guy missed one kick all year and missed that one. But, and gave him another chance. And then they couldn't capitalize. So, it, yeah, it's they have Paul Pascaloni involved. And Paul Pascaloni, I covered him when he was with the Dolphins 12, 13 years ago, and he was old then. I mean, I'm not an ageist here, but, I mean, a 73-year-old guy on the sideline, I mean, that isn't really, like, the best, like, um, deal at this point in this in the game at this stage. Not that he's going to be around after this. How um, much? You know, oh, they, got, they got guys moving up from the support staff. I mean, it's just they're just piecing together a staff. Bottom line. All right, I, Paul knows this. He's a Florida State alum. But my question is: is that Florida, Florida State, and Miami are a mess? How much does that hurt them? All of them, when all of them aren't very good, or does it? It's, it's terrible. I mean, I used to live in New Mexico. I covered Dave Bliss in fact, for four years. I'm sure, I don't know if I should mention his name on the air. That, he turned out to be a huge disappointment, but, but more than that. But, um, yeah, I was out there, and uh, that was like, that was amazing football being played across the country. I would get up, and like, it'd be at 10 o'clock, you know, mountain time, I watched some Auburn, unbeaten Auburn play in the swamp, man, on that kind of a Foggy day. It was an amazing game, 36 33. I remember that game. It was 1994. I mean, this was great football from afar. You're like, man, I wish I lived in Florida for that. And then you get here and it's like, okay, what happened? Um, <laughs> now, I did get here for Miami's last national title, but the slow decline began, other than Urban and then the one a couple years with Jimbo and Jameis. Otherwise, it's been pretty mediocre football for those programs. I mean, yeah, Dan had a couple of spikes there, you know, I guess. But it hasn't been championship football in this state overall since the 90s. So here's what you got, guys. Third game in three years at the Swamp. I mean, third time, excuse me, at the Swamp now in a row where there's been an interim coach on one of the sidelines. 17, you had Randy Shannon for the Gators. 19, Odell Haggins. They didn't play the game last year. And now you got Greg Knox. That's where these programs sit. Two teams with losing records, an interim coach. 17, two teams with losing records with an interim coach. I mean, it's unbelievable. That's where this this series is evolved. Yeah, somewhere in the 90s are now completely dead. Uh, It's it's just hard. (laughs) All right, so when it comes to replacements, I know the the fans are going to want Lane Kiffin or Mario Cristobal or, or someone like that. Uh, Billy Napier is a name that's been kicked around. I actually think he'd be a, a great uh, fit in, in Gainesville, especially with what he does. But where do you think that Scott Strickland will lean as far as philosophy and and leadership when it comes to that program? Well, he better be a great fit because I think it's trending in that direction. Hmm. And, I, yeah, I mean, we're hearing – I mean, it's out there that Napier – is there, you know, they, they like Napier. I mean, there's on Twitter, but you know, Twitter's so untrustworthy. My God, you know, um, if I listen to Twitter, I mean, you know, I might as well go freaking put, turn a noose over the ceiling fan in the other room. But, um, the way they see fans treat me sometimes, but it's like, I think that Napier is a interesting and a lot, a choice with a lot of upside, but some risk. I think Mario Cristobal is expensive with a $9 million buyout. You're paying Dan 12 right now, plus a little assistance. Plus, they played 22-4, paid 22-4 to McElwain and Muschamp. Can you just, I mean, maybe 45 in the, in the, in the hole before they even got the guy on campus. 
right? So I don't know about him financially. Plus, he's an O-line coach. Great recruiter, though, and knows this state. Um, Kiffin is a non-starter from everything we hear. He's not even on the radar. He might want the job, the Gators. It just doesn't fit. It's like I joked with someone last night. It's like be like covering the Trump White House. It'd probably be entertaining at times, but you never know what's coming. And I do think that uh, Napier might be the guy. James Franklin just got locked up by Penn State. Firstly, I think the home run hire is Luke Fickle. But you can you convince him to leave the Midwest with his six children, move to Gainesville, you know, to the Bible Belt. He's a staunch Catholic. He's a Midwestern guy. Does he really want to come down and live here? I mean, it would be a great opportunity for him, but there's one waiting for him when he, when the time comes for him to move. You know, I'm sure he can get whatever job he wants. That's the home run hire because I think he's a program builder. Is Billy? Probably. I mean, he works under Saban. He works under Dabo. He has a great attention to detail, I'm told. Um, he's all about, like, surrounding himself with an army of, like, analysts and support staff people. So that's where the money is going to be spent. But he's a $2 million top dollar guy at Louisiana, Lafayette. You could probably get for five here, but you're going to have to kick in a ton on his support staff. So it's never cheap. And maybe I'm underselling Billy in the market. I mean, the market's just crazy right now. Maybe he gets six and a half, you know. I mean, he gets a triples his salary. I mean, who knows? But he could be intriguing. He coaches offense. Um, 42-year-old guy could be a rising star. I mean, he is a rising star. I, is this too big a job? I mean, does he need an intermediate jump before that? I don't know. Virginia Tech apparently really likes him, too. Maybe that's a better fit. Edgar, as always, thank you. I know it's been a busy couple of two or three days. It's always been that way when you cover Florida. Thank you very much, buddy. Appreciate it, and have a great week. Good yeah. luck. Uh, yeah, man, hit me up once they make a decision. We'll do it again. Absolutely. You, uh, you got it. Thank you very much. We enjoy having you on. Edgar Thompson, Orlando Sentinel, covers Florida. And I thought that he gave us some great insight on many things and how they are defunct, maybe, uh, maybe in, in many ways, as they take on the Seminoles who have gotten a little life back in their legs. But, but if I had told you in 1996 no, that no. this game in 2021 will be for bowl eligibility for one of the teams, for bowl eligibility, not, not which team might go into the, like, get the votes and go into the national championship, you're like, no way. And if you would have said that about USC, yeah. USC 96, if you would have said that about Nebraska, if you would have said mm -hmm. that about Texas, well, then they were actually going through. They won the Big 12 title in 96. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to hear from Scott Drew. But uh, Armstrong, do you have that tweet on the Coach Drinkwitz comment? Uh, you saw him pull out the saber right underneath his shirt <laughs> uh, after the post game with, uh, with Florida. Last year, Mullen kind of threw some shade at, uh, at Missouri. Here's, here's Missouri coach Drinkwitz on 1010XL explaining the irony of beating the Gators and Mullen after last year's near brawl. My father was a farmer, and there's an old saying, you reap what you sow. If you sow kindness, you reap kindness. If you sow jackass, you reap jackass. I mean, God. there's not even anything veiled in that. But, you know, that was the game last year where Dan Mullen, at the, going into halftime, was – trying to get his players fired up and was uh, inciting the fans to to get all riled up and they were there was a, a near fight on the field yeah and it was like one of the things like man dan what are you doing here uh and and so yeah i'm not surprised that it happened i think dan mullen's gonna wind up in the nfl i think he'll probably be a pretty good nfl coach as a matter of fact uh because he's a good offensive mind and he won't have to recruit well when it comes to drinkowitz's comments uh he who last 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 hardest uh, so, you know, he, he definitely won that final round uh, with Mullen. Uh, it's a really intriguing job. I'm, I'm curious to see if it is going to be Billy Napier or somebody else, but uh, should be a, a good one this weekend. I mean, in terms of the competitiveness level, obviously not the two best versions of these programs that we're going to be seeing lining up, but, you know, all the outside noise and storylines and the fact that uh, FSU making a bowl game would be a big deal for them and, you know, Florida overcoming what they're dealing with right now. I think that would be a big deal, you know, for those players in the long run as well. So, yeah, there, there's high stakes, just not uh, the most high quality. Uh, but still, it's, it's Florida, Florida State, so it'll be interesting. Baylor's offensive line. You talk about what if somebody would have said that in the mid-'90s, if I would have told you a year ago earlier this year that Baylor's offensive line would be named a Joe Moore Award semifinalist of the most outstanding offensive line unit in college football. 
criteria, toughness, effort, teamwork, consistency, technique, and finishing. They're a part of that list. The list, I think, has, uh, oh, I don't know, there's like 10 or 12 teams on it. Baylor. And what a job by Eric Mateos and company by getting that. Jalen Petrie, a finalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Thomas Everett won that with Baylor, remember? Uh, so he's a finalist for the award. Also, uh, one other note, there was, uh, oh, the uh, the Outland Trophy Award finalist. Jordan Davis of Georgia. Uh, Mwangu, uh, Ekwanu from North Carolina State as an offensive lineman. And Tyler Lindenbaum, center from Iowa. Those are the finalists. The Blitnikoff finalists, Jordan Addison from Pittsburgh. Jamison Williams of Alabama. And David Bell from Purdue. Those are the finalists of the Blitnikoff Award as well. Mm. When we come... Yeah, I, 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 I vote for the uh, Blitnikoff. I don't know about that Blitnikoff. I voted I think for them. I, you, all three of those guys? No. Yeah, I don't. I I personally don't like the David Bell pick. Uh, just uh, that I mean, I, he's had a great season, but I, I think that uh, there's others that I probably would have voted for. I, as a matter of fact, I don't have a vote, but I had somebody consult with me on their vote uh, and just kind of trade back and forth. And I definitely had two of those, and I'm trying to think who my third one was. I think it was J, uh, Stearns at uh, UTEP. Jared Stearns. Uh, Jared yep. Stearns. I said Jared. Yeah. Jared Stearns, who is like top three in basically every single receiving category, but he doesn't play in a power five. So I know that he's automatically behind the eight ball. Um, as far as that goes, uh, I'm sure it doesn't help that, you know, Western Kentucky also throws like six touchdowns a game. And so maybe there's some knock on, you know, not only who he plays for, but the way they go about things. I don't know, but I, yeah, I, I think Jared Stearns and there was one other who I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering who's right now. the receiver from southern cal who's missed some time but put up monster Drake numbers London. yeah Drake, but yeah. he got hurt he you got know. hurt he was in the conversation all the way to the end no question about it yeah i mean david bell's you know i don't want to make it sound like he's not deserving that wasn't the point i just i had you know somebody else on that list but uh yeah that's that's good to see these are starting to get down to the nitty-gritty and uh, we'll see what happens i was going to get up the stats uh for the receiving but we got to go to a break Craig has off the radar in about 20 minutes. Coming up next, Baylor men's basketball coach Scott Drew from the Bahamas, the battle for Atlantis. They tip off just after our show tomorrow.